Despite being on the market since 2009, the Nissan 370Z is still the company's only true sports car. However, the car has had few changes over the past eight years, and the price remains higher than most other vehicles in the same performance category. When you search affordable Japanese sports coupe on the internet, Nissan's original Z car shows up in almost every article, but the 240Z is now as expensive as the current generation Z. This likely means enthusiasts are yearning for the next generation of Z car. Nissan revealed more information about the newest iteration of the 370Z which will go on sale later in 2017. The prices for the base 370Z Coupe and Roadster are taken from the 2017 model year and will start at $29,990 and $41,820 for the Roadster. However, customers can expect to spend $39,590 or $49,400 for a fully loaded Coupe or Roadster, respectively, that's a lot of money. While the prices are high, Nissan promises new features and options for both 370Z variants. Major differences from the 2017 model included exterior styling changes, new exterior paint options, upgraded tune and clutch, and more speakers. The 370Z Coupe offers four different trim levels while the Roadster only offers three but both cars can be had with either a 7-speed automatic or 6-speed manual transmission. Also new for this year is the Heritage Edition package for the base 370Z, Nissan's celebration of 50 years of Z cars. Nissan's 370Z NISMO gets new features for this year too, as Nissan wants it to reflect its iconic GTR as much as possible for a fourth of the price. Featuring GTR-like aerodynamics, Dunlop high-performance tires, EXEDY clutch, and an 18-horsepower bump over the standard 370Z, the new 370Z NISMO tech promises to simulate its bigger brother. The manual version will retail at $45,690 and its automatic twin will start at $47,090. We hope that this is the last version of the 370Z and that it goes out with a bang before the next Z car is unveiled. The team at Aveco Australia are delighted with the sales performance of the versatile Aveco Daily in 2017. Coming on the back of another impressive month of sales for Aveco across their entire range of vehicles in June, Aveco had just released Truck Industry Council tick, data showing the Daily is proving one of the sales stars. The tick figures show the daily cab chassis was the best-selling European light truck model in Australia with 390 units sold so far in 2017. That total, up 90 units on the same period last year, represents a strong 7.2% market share. While Iveco daily van sales are up by 40 units with 164 sales. Iveco Australia boss, Michael Johnson, tells us the results are very pleasing. Increasingly, operators are becoming more aware of the benefits of European light trucks such as the Daily Range, when compared to its cab over competitors, the Daily ticks a lot more boxes. This is particularly the case in terms of safety equipment, engine power and efficiency, and buyers are really drawn to our 8-speed full automatic automatic transmission. Iveco had just expanded the daily range in Australia to include a new high-capacity commercial van variant. Iveco can now offer vans ranging in volume capacity from 7.3 meters cubed to a market-leading 19.6 meters cubed and with GVMs up to a market-leading 7,000 kilograms in the new Euro 670C. Mr. Johnson said, while an increase in supply of daily vans to Australian vehicle rental businesses and the local arrival of the 2017 minibus of the year, the Iveco Daily Bus, are expected to help push sales even further north. Check out our most recent Iveco Daily review and find out more about a new technology that is helping Iveco trucks use less fuel and produce less harmful emissions. Microcars are tricky for car manufacturers. They have to keep prices well down to attract buyers, which means profit margins are tight, 
which means they need to sell big numbers to make a decent profit. And Aussies aren't buying them. Only 3576 microcars had been sold to the end of June, a paltry 0.6% of total sales so far this year. Most brands don't bother bringing their microcars over here, it's currently a battlefield of just five combatants, the Fiat 500, Holden Spark, Mitsubishi Mirage, Suzuki Salvareo and Kia Picanto. But with this new generation, the latter may now be the pick of the bunch. Kia hasn't made sweeping changes with its new Picanto, it still has a 1.3-liter four-cylinder petrol engine paired with an old-school four-speed automatic, or you can grab a five-speed manual, with outputs basically identical to its predecessor. But despite the aging combination, it didn't really need overhauling. The engine is a willing rever without sounding overworked, the 4-speed does a good job and you can cruise at freeway speeds easily. Around town it's papy enough and sips fuel as it goes about its business, I got about 6.5 L-100 km in a week of urban driving. The cabin still offers great headroom and visibility with plenty of storage. But the small changes add up to elevate the Picanto. Once on the highway, there's now cruise control. The previous small 200-liter boot has expanded to 255 liters, a significant increase. The features list isn't stingy, with auto headlights, reverse camera and sensors, heated wing mirrors, USB and 12-volt inputs and Android Auto Apple CarPlay all included. The new 7-inch touchscreen is arguably the biggest addition. Not only is it stacked with features but it replaces the red lid head unit which aged the previous model dramatically. Combined with some satin silver trim and the Picanto's cabin is classy, particularly for its price. And Kia has nailed the pricing, the auto is a low $15,690 drive away, the manual is $14,190 plus on roads. Add in a 5-star AMC AP crash safety rating and Kia's industry-leading 7-7-7 after-sales program, 7 years warranty, roadside assistance and cap price servicing, and the Picanto's value is hard to ignore. It's not perfect by any means, the ride isn't as cosseting as bigger cars, nor is the sound insulation as resilient and the touchscreen required surprising force to make selections. And this is indeed a micro car, as comfy as the Picanto is up front, adults of most sizes will struggle fitting into the back. Headroom is good but footroom is particularly tight and there's zero storage space back there. Like many in its class, the steering wheel's reach cannot be adjusted, leaving taller drivers feeling like they're reaching for the wheel. But let's get real, no one's buying this to load up with a family of five. The Picanto is cheap, safe, decent to drive and well equipped, which are words microcar buyers will likely love to hear. The Aston Martin Valkyrie already looks insane enough on paper, using a mid-mounted 6.5-liter V12 paired with a KERS-style hybrid powertrain, but the Aston Martin hypercar is not running out of crazy anytime soon. The car itself is still taking shape. Aston Martin is applying some final tweaks to the exterior design, and this week they've shared some more borderline unbelievable details about the project. For instance, the Aston Martin badge itself was actually deemed too heavy for the car, but Aston Martin felt that a sticker would be too cheap. The solution, a chemical etched aluminum badge just 70 microns thick, 30% thinner than a human hair, and 99.4% lighter than the wing badge that Aston uses on its production cars. That's pretty close to it not existing in this time-space continuum at all. Another example of the lengths to which Aston Martin and Red Bull F1 engineers went to try to save weight is the center high-mounted stoplight, which is mounted on the very tip of the small shark fin that tapers off the roof of the car. The LED light itself is just 5.5mm wide and 9.5mm tall, effectively existing within the already thin shark fin. And of course, 
traditional door mirrors were deemed to be too much of an aerodynamic drag and have been replaced by rear-facing cameras mounted in the flanks, with the images fed to two screens mounted in the car's eight pillars. The lack of mirrors also allows for a less interrupted peripheral field of vision, which is one of the aspects of race cars that Aston Martin engineers have tried to achieve in the Valkyrie, along with the placement of all switch gear on the steering wheel, as in an F1 car. All of the car's vital signs are displayed on a screen integrated into the steering, which itself is designed to be detachable in order to aid driver ingress and egress and it will also make the drivers feel like they're driving a street-legal F1 car, which is arguably the Valkyrie's aim. It's been a tremendous challenge to make the interior packaging work, Aston Martin Creative Director of Interiors Matt Hill said. We've embraced Red Bull Racing's Formula One ethos and approached it from a different angle than conventional road car design. In this instance, we've started from a position where you think something is impossible and work at it until you find a way to make it work. We've been fighting for millimeters everywhere, but the battle has been worth it, as it's been fantastic seeing customers try the interior buck for size. They love the ritual of getting in and how it feels to be sat behind the wheel. They're also genuinely surprised at how the car just seems to swallow them. You really do have to sit in it to believe there is genuine space for two large adults. Minimalism is definitely the theme of this hypercar, which is expected to be lighter than the porker known as the Mazda MX-5 Miata while delivering around 1,100 horsepower. Aston Martin is still keeping many details of the car under wraps, but it's safe to say that the production version may be even more futuristic than the concept car itself. I would say we're around 95% of the way there with the exterior design, Aston Martin Creative Director of Exterior Design Miles Nurnberger said. Much of what you see is actually the structure of the car, so this had to be signed off, on, relatively early in the project. The remaining areas of non-structural bodywork are still subject to evolution and change as Adrian, Nui, continues to explore ways of finding more downforce. The new outlets in the body are case in point. Ordinarily, the last thing we'd want to do to one of our surfaces is cut a hole in it, but these vents work the front wing so much harder that they've found a significant gain in front downforce. The fact that they are so effective gives them their own functional beauty, but we finesse them without impacting on their functionality. That they also serve as windows through which to view the fabulous wing section front wishbones is a welcome bonus. But the design of the Valkyrie, as with F1 cars, is dictated largely by aerodynamics, with the generation of downforce being one of the engineering priorities. These goals have dictated much of the car's bodywork, with the lower tab contours following the space between the Venturi tunnels that run along the sides of the cockpit floor. This lends the Valkyrie the appearance of sitting high off the ground, though in reality the seating position is effectively on the floor of the tub itself. These tunnels are responsible for much of the car's downforce, drawing air to the rear diffuser while keeping the top of the car largely free from other aerodynamic devices aimed at generating downforce. There are still many things we've yet to learn about the car, the debut of the production version is still a year away, and Aston Martin will be tweaking its interior and exterior until then. The company still plans to make just 175 Valkyries, with 25 of them to be built solely for track use. The first examples are scheduled to be delivered in 2019. We wouldn't be surprised if Aston Martin finds ways to shave a few more pounds from the car before then, and prospective owners are probably looking at ways to shave a few more pounds themselves to avoid being a burden to the car's curb weight.